so I'm very, very excited to introduce uh, Kirill Solovey, uh, who is a roboticist specializing in multi-robot systems and their applications to smart mobility. Uh, Kirill is currently a, uh, a postdoctoral scholar at the uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics Department at Stanford University, working with uh, Professor Marco Pagone. Uh, and he is also part of the Center for Automotive uh, Research. He obtained a PhD in computer science from uh, Tel Aviv University, where he was advised by uh, Dan Halpern, uh, working on uh, planning, control, uh, and uh, optimization problems. Uh, Kirill's research focuses on the design of effective control and decision-making uh, mechanisms to allow multi-robot systems to tackle complex problems for the benefit of society. Uh, and his work, as you will see, draws upon, uh, draws upon ideas that span um, the disciplines of engineering, computer science, and transportation science, uh, all in the service of developing uh, scalable optimization approaches with substantial guarantees regarding quality and robustness of, of the produced solutions. He has received multiple awards for uh, his work, including um, the Clore Scholars and Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellowships. And he's also won multiple Best Paper Awards and nominations at uh, some of the top conferences in robotics and control, including RSS, ICRA, and the European Control uh, Conference. And he has also won a number of teaching awards. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm very, very excited to uh, let Kirill uh, take it away. Thank you, Florian. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm uh, really happy to be with you and share uh, my work with you. And hopefully this would lead to some uh, interesting discussions in the future. I didn't get a chance to visit your part of Canada yet, but uh, at least I can be with you virtually. And hopefully in the future, we will get to meet uh, more uh, actually physically. So. Today, I'm going to present to you my ongoing work on um, large scale multi robot systems. And uh, I will, as a, as a roboticist and as a computer scientist, I will highlight the, the algorithmic challenges that are involved in working on those systems. And I'll, but I'll also mention a few of the engineering aspects that we need to tackle when we, we, that we in order to really make those uh, systems effective. So I'll begin this talk with uh, very basic problems that we need to solve to tackle, uh, to, to operate multi-robot systems effectively. And we would gradually move to actual applications of those systems in the real world. And namely, uh, I, the majority of the talk will be uh, focused on applications of multi-robot systems in smart mobility. And this is a really exciting area. And I'm really uh, happy that I, I get a chance to work with, work in because it combines both uh, the world of engineering and also requires understand, the understanding of what kind of impact those uh, systems will have on the society. So with that said, um, I would like to begin. So, Motor robot systems are already around us. And although we don't necessarily see them in our homes nowadays or on the streets, one of the most common examples for multi robot systems that are already implemented is what, what, what you're currently doing, what currently happens whenever you press the buy now button in, in when, you're, when you're buying something from Amazon. So every time you do that, you're essentially commanding a fleet of those uh, Roomba-like robots to move shelves around the facility to organize the package for you. And besides this, there are also other applications that are currently happening in the real world, including uh, in agriculture and inspection. And in the future, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see more applications where motor robot systems actually help in addressing uh, either dangerous problems or, or, or issues that we currently don't have the means to address effectively enough. For example, in the last uh, few months, we had terrible fires in uh, the West Coast of, uh, of North America. And I'm hopeful in that in a few more years, we would actually be able to employ robots to help us with, uh, to mitigate the, the effects of those uh, fires. I am most excited about the applications of multi-robot systems in the future in smart mobility. So 
I'm, I'm currently living in the Bay Area and uh, every once in a while when I go for a walk in my neighborhood, I would see one of those weird cars that, that has so many uh, different sensors mounted on it. I'm not sure if you guys have it in, on your, in around Toronto. I'm quite, quite positive you already have some. Okay, so Florian. So and shows me that you already have those, some of those, and it won't be long before we will have uh, in the next few years uh, entire systems consisting of of autonomous vehicles that would need to drive people around uh, in our cities, and there are numerous benefits that are associated with those systems. They're expected to be more efficient and more uh, sustainable, uh, safe. And, and, and can even address several different societal issues that I will highlight uh, along in this talk. But the crucial thing to understand where we're when considering all of those applications of multi-robot systems is that it really, in order to reap all the benefits that are associated with them, we need to be able to solve very challenging optimization problems that are introduced by those systems. So, and there are a few reasons of why those, those optimization problems that arise from multi-robot systems are, are difficult. The first thing is that we need to capture not only the constraints and the uh, collision avoidance constraints and the properties of the individual robots in our systems, but we also need to capture the interactions between the individual robots, between the different robots. And this already introduces a very high dimensional search space with a lot of variables. And this is also a continuous space, which makes it even much more uh, difficult. And if we're shifting to the, set, to the already to the setting where those robots are deployed in, in the real world, then we don't need, we not only need to account for the huge scale. So consider a fleet of autonomous vehicles driving around San Francisco. So not only that the scale is huge, but we also need to capture the effect that those systems have on the real world and how they interact with the environment and people and what is the feedback that they get from them. So this is another level of complexity that we need to deal with. And finally, we, our, our algorithms, the control mechanisms that we design for those systems must have theoretical guarantees to, to, to make sure that those systems are safe and that we can run those systems quickly enough to be able to recover from errors. And finally, that we can also guarantee some perf performance on, on the solution quality. So all of those considerations make the design of effective optimization approaches and, and control mechanisms for multi-robot systems very challenging in practice. So my work is in response to that is uh, concerned with, uh, with designing effective optimization methods for multi-robot systems. And as uh, Florian mentioned earlier, I work in, in a few areas, I'm particularly uh, interested in the design of uh, algorithmic approaches. So I'm, consider myself half a computer scientist, half a roboticist. And um, I borrow a lot of techniques from the world of engineering. And in my most recent work in smart mobility, I, I also employ a lot of techniques that are, uh, were designed in, from the world of uh, transportation science. So today I want to share with you some of those interesting uh, challenges that we encounter and some opportunities that uh, multi-robot systems uh, propose. Um, so I'll start the talk with some of the fundamental uh, mechanisms that are required to tackle multi-robot, uh, to, to employ multi-robot systems. And this would be multi-robot motion planning problems and task allocation. So I'll, I'll mention a few of my recent results in this area and what, what do we need to improve and what is the next steps. Then I will briefly mention a, very, a work that I'm very excited about that we recently developed on the use of multi-drone systems for package delivery. And this specific approach that we developed has a very uh, unique feature that I won't disclose right now. And some of you can look at the figure and maybe identify what is weird here, um, but I'll, I'll mention it later. And the majority of my talk will be devoted to a very fundamental problem that uh, we will encounter in future mobility systems, namely, how do we how do control and operate effectively an entire fleet of autonomous vehicles that need to drive 
people around in a, in a large city area. Yeah, so with that said, um, we can start with the first part. So as a, as a fresh graduate student in Tel Aviv University, the first, my, my first goal in research was to understand how do, can we uh, provide effective tools for, for the most fundamental problem that we can think of when we're actually thinking about multi-robot systems, which is multi-robot motion planning. So in any uh, application of multi-robot systems, we need to solve one variation or another of this problem. And so what is this problem? We need to find, given a collection of origins and destinations for our robots, we need to find a set of collision-free paths. And by collisions here, I mean two things. First of all, collisions with the environment and collisions between the robots and in themselves. So already this uh, seemingly innocent problem or, or, or challenge is, is quite complex in many different ways and many different levels. And there is still a lot of work that is going on in this area because there is always a need to provide more and more efficient tools for this fundamental problem. As, the, the first thing that I observed when I uh, started to work on those uh, on, on multi-robot motion planning was that there is a, quite a lot of similarity between the continuous problem that we have on the left and this puzzle-like uh, problem that you can see on the right. And I'm sure that many of you have, have spent a little bit of time trying to solve this uh, annoying puzzle that you see on the right. And um, What's, what's important about this, this puzzle is that it is essentially a discrete version of the problem that we have on the left. And of course, the, this is just an example. Those numbers here are just one example, but you can think on, about a gen, more general uh, uh, formulations of this puzzle where we have an actual underlying graph. So together with my advisor back then, Dan Halperin, and a few more uh, researchers, we developed a series of, uh, of algorithms that allow us to transform this continuous problem of multi-robot motion planning into a sequence of uh, those puzzle-like problems, which is called pebble motion. And by doing that, we can decompose those, this continuous problem into a discrete problem that can be solved rather efficiently. And moreover, a solution to this discrete problem yields an, a solution to, uh, so the way that we decompose the problem guarantees that by solving the puzzle, we get a solution for our motion planning problem. And in fact, in many cases, we can actually show that the solution that we get is optimal and we can uh, implement it very efficiently. And in fact, this led to some of the most scalable and uh, uh, efficient algorithms for multi-robot motion planning available today. With that said, because of some of, due to some of the mechanisms that we use to actually develop those algorithms, those approaches are currently limited to relatively simple settings of robots, namely holonomic systems that operate in the plane. So I, I realized that in order to be able to extend or develop approaches that apply to more uh, uh, general robotic systems, I need to look into and understand better the world of uh, assembling based planners. So something based planners, and here I'm talking about the setting of individual robots. So something based planners are, is a very uh, popular technique for uh, motion planning of one individual robot. So the visualization you can see here, this uh, rectangle represents the configuration space of our robot where the white areas represent the collision-free configurations of space and the gray areas represent the, the obstacle space. And the main, the main idea behind uh, sampling based planners that instead of explicitly representing this uh, state space of the problem, it aims to capture, sampling based planners aim to capture the structure of this space via random sampling. And while after, after they would draw a few samples, uh, maybe a large number of samples, what we can do to, to each sample, we can validate very easily whether this is a collision-free configuration of sample or, or a state or not. And eventually we can also connect nearby samples 
with very simple paths. So eventually this introduces or induces a structure of a graph. And the very nice property that this graph has is that every discrete path in the graph induces a collision-free path for our actual robotic systems, robotic system. And because of the specific, the basic ingredients that it requires, it, which are very simple, collision detection, and nearest neighbor search, it is very easily implemented on a variety of uh, robotic systems. And in my work, together with my collaborators, we developed a few new algorithms for motion planning, striving to be more efficient than the previous work. But we also established a sound theoretical foundation to analyze and understand uh, assembly-based planners. And we were able to resolve questions such as, for instance, what is the number of samples that we need to produce? How do we connect samples? And what kind of properties do those algorithms have? And in many cases, we can actually show that those algorithms have guaranteed to return a solution that is new optimal to the, re to the uh, optimal solution for the, the continuous motion planning problem. Mm -hmm. So armed with this understanding of uh, motion of sampling based planners for individual robots, I, I turned to design mechanisms for multi-robot motion planning. And the, the main insight that I developed here together with my collaborators is that we can essentially uh, com combine those motion planning roadmaps that are constructed for individual robots in a way that it produces a, a new roadmap such that it encodes not only the, mo the collision free motions for individual robots, but also the interactions between robots. So it also, in besides avoiding collisions with obstacles, we can also avoid collisions with, uh, between one robot and another. And in fact, this led to the first approach for multi-robot motion planning, assembly-based multi-robot motion planning, that is both scalable and has strong theoretical guarantees on the solution quality. And with that said, I would just like to mention that there is still a lot of work necessary to uh, in, in this area because uh, we, we always need more, more efficient and more fast tools for multi-robot motion planning because, because this is such a basic and fundamental problem. So this perhaps the second most uh, occurring uh, problem or mechanism that is required in virtually all multi-robot systems is task allocation. So in task allocation, as the name suggests, the goal is to understand how to, to uh, distribute resources and tasks between the individual robots in our system in order to guarantee the most effective use of the robots to accomplish a common goal. So for example, in a recent uh, project, uh, which is a collaboration with uh, a few researchers from NASA JTL, we were motivated by a future NASA mission to study the surface of Mars using a fleet of heterogeneous or, or satellites with heterogeneous capabilities. And the, the problem there is to understand how to distribute those satellites and move them from one location to another to maximize the amount of information that they can collect over from the surface of Mars. And let me mention here that in general, task allocation different, uh, differs very much from one application to another. And it's, it seems quite difficult to, re to find uh, one approach or a solution approach that would be applicable to a variety of different problems. But with that said, in many of my works, we, sh we can show that by exploiting the unique structure of those underlying problems, we can design very effective uh, approaches. For, so for example, for in this specific case of uh, those satellites, we were able to show that we can decompose this uh, seemingly complex problem into a sequence of mean cost flow problems, which is a very one of the most fundamental problems that we have in optimization. And by doing this decomposition, we can afterwards combine the different results in a way that guarantees uh, a near optimal uh, solution with a, a very uh, um, limited resource of time. So we can do it very efficiently as well. Mm -hmm. 
in, in my most recent work, we combined our uh, understanding in, in, in motion planning and routing for multi-robot systems with, uh, with mechanisms for task allocation. And this is joint work with uh, Shushman Shadawuri, who is a PhD student in Stanford, together with uh, his advisor, Michael Konchendorfer, and my host in Stanford, uh, Marco Pavone. And in this specific application, <clears throat> we're interested to design a system for efficient uh, use of multiple drones to deliver packages uh, across an urban area. The motivation for this work is that a current package delivery services uh, incredibly overburden our uh, road networks. And we would like to, um, to understand how we can uh, alleviate some of those um, congestion effects that are introduced by delivery trucks. And of course, one, one of the approaches that comes to mind is to use uh, drones for delivery. And a few companies have already considered that. And also there are quite a few papers on that in, in, uh, in the academia. But there is one big limitation when we're considering drones for those package uh, delivery applications, which is that drones usually have a very limited flight range. And for the delivery, we need them to be able to cover large ranges of our cities. So the, the distinguishing feature of the framework that we propose here is that we allow drones to land on top of uh, public transit vehicles, and essentially hitchhike upon uh, buses or trains, which allows them to conserve their batteries and essentially extend uh, their effective uh, flight range. So I just want to show you one visualization of how, how this would look like uh, in a simulation. Uh, why doesn't it start? Yeah, okay. So, for this specific simulation, we used a real uh, network of public transit in San Francisco. The circles that you see here are drones, where the color uh, tells us whether this is a drone that is currently in flight mode, which is a blue circle, or a drone that sits on top of a public transit vehicle. So for example, this red drone is currently waiting for a bus. And then when it gets close enough to the facility, to the depot, uh, it, it flies back. And um, one of the interesting observations that we obtained from this paper, is this, this uh, framework that we designed, is that drones can uh, extend their effective coverage range by as much as two times or four times when, when, when we tested it on a real public transit networks in the cities of uh, San Francisco and uh, Washington DC. Now, I won't get too much into the algorithmic details of this approach here. I will just mention that this is a very, very complex problem that we need to solve. We want to distribute to understand what is the best way to distribute between packages, drones, what are the routes that the drones take, and what is the order that the, the packages are delivered by the individual drones in order to minimize the delivery time of the last packet. And this is a very complex simulation problem. And to tackle it, we designed a, quite an effective uh, approach that uh, con essentially consists of two layers, where in the first layer, we uh, perform task allocation. And then we use this uh, efficient solution for task allocation uh, in a lower level that executes the solution in a way that guarantees avoidance of conflicts between individual drones and guaranteeing that all the constraints of the problem are uh, satisfied. In, for instance, uh, that we don't have too many drones landing on the same vehicle at a given time and that, and that the energy constraints of the drones are satisfied as well. Mm -hmm. And the, this, this uh, work introduces much more problems that we actually solve in the paper. And there is quite a lot of interesting things that we're uh, considering doing now. One of the things that we, of course, wanted to understand really is uh, what is the economic viability of uh, such a service? And despite how crazy all this uh, approach sounds like, there was one uh, operator of one of the major uh, cities, operator of a public transit network in one of the main major cities in, uh, in the US that approached us and considered to implement this idea. 
Unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we had to change our plans a little bit, but I'm still hopeful that we will get, get to run a case study to understand what is the economic implications of this work. So now I want to move to the, to the main focus of this talk where we'll discuss some challenges and opportunities in the operation of uh, autonomous mobility on demand system. Autonomous mobility on demand is essentially, so consider uh, yourself as an operator of a service like Uber and, and or Lyft, but which consists entirely of autonomous vehicles. And the question here is, how do we distribute the vehicles and route them within a city in the best manner possible to satisfy the demand, but also to minimize the, the, either the operational cost of the system on how, or how much do those systems affect um, the traffic in, uh, in, our, in our cities. And those autonomous mobility on demand has, has the potential to overcome a lot of the issues that are present in our current transportation systems and also in ride hailing services. But to really do that effectively, we must capture very well how those systems interact with the environment and in particular, how they introduce congestions and so essentially being congestion aware and how they can uh, be used in a way that uh, fosters accessibility and, uh, and reduces the environmental strain of those systems. So the first thing that the, the, the most basic aspect that I want to, you to consider with me is how do we uh, control those systems in a way that we minimize the, the amount of travel time that those systems introduce. And to do, the, to do this really effectively, what we must capture is how individual vehicles in our, in our fleets affect travel times of one another. So essentially we want to be able to design an approach that is congestion aware. In a recent paper with uh, Mauro Salazar and uh, Marco Pavone, we demonstrated by exploiting the unique problem structure of autonomous mobility on demand routing, we can develop an approach that is congestion aware and, and is also very effective in practice. So from the theoretical perspective, we show that our approach is guaranteed to minimize the total travel time while accounting for congestion effects. From the practical perspective, we were able to show mathematically, oh, sorry, we were able to show in uh, free simulations that uh, um, we can solve massive problem sets within a few seconds and by massive, I, for example, we, we can tackle the entire uh, rush hour demand of Manhattan within just a few seconds on a commodity laptop, which is by several orders of magnitude faster than uh, previous work in this area. From a mathematical perspective, autonomous mobility or demand routing in, in a congestion aware fashion uh, can be viewed as a convex program. This, in, this is of course very useful mathematically, but in itself is not enough to guarantee an efficient solution because just plugging the entire problem uh, formulation that we have into a convex programming solver yields running times of on the order of hours, which is unacceptable in our case. So the main insight that we obtain in our work is that we can transform this autonomous mobility on demand routing problem into a slightly simple problem called traffic assignment. And I will get later on what, what, is, the, what is the unique feature in this traffic assignment problem? What is the difference between traffic assignment and AMD routing? For now, let us just mention that traffic assignment is again, is another convex program but it has a very specific, a very useful property uh, in our, in our uh, domain. In particular, when we apply a gradient descent 
approach for convex optimization, specifically the Frank Wolf algorithm for convex optimization on the traffic assignment problem, it essentially breaks the implementation of the problem into a sequence of individual shortest path queries. So whenever we need to solve a linearization step for this traffic assignment problem, instead of requiring us to solve a linear program, which can take a lot of time in the context of our formulation, instead, all we need to do is solve multi, uh, multiple shortest path queries, which we can do very efficiently nowadays. And this is what allows us to, to be able to solve those massive problems in, in such a, uh, an effective manner. So now I want to walk you through the details of this approach. The input to the problem consists of a graph on which our vehicles operate, where every road segment is represented by an edge. And we also have a characterization of the demand, namely how many people are traveling in our systems and what are their origins and destinations. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the person on the right, okay, wonderful. The person on the right needs to travel between this origin to this destination. And our goal is to specify routes for our vehicles to, to ensure that this happens. Now, we already emphasized that it is crucial to capture a congestion effects introduced by our, our vehicles. So how do we do that in our paper? Here we leverage a very uh, common approach in uh, transportation science. We assign to every edge in our graph a travel time function that simply specifies what, what is the travel time as a function of the number of vehicles that are passing through this edge. And this function behaves very naturally. When the traffic volume is low, the travel time is low, and as increase the volume of traffic, so does the travel time increases until a certain point where travel time increases very rapidly, which essentially represents the onset of uh, congestion. So we have such a function that is associated with every individual edge. Of course, those functions differ a little bit between one edge to another because we have highways, we have a uh, small road, we have, and, and so on. So given all those ingredients, we can formulate the AMOD routing problem as the following minimization problem, which is a convex program. We want to minimize the total travel time of all the vehicles in the system. So how does this look like? It's simply a sum over all the edges in the graph where for every edge, we multiply the volume of traffic along the edge, which is Xe, times the travel time along the edge, which is, again, a function of the volume of traffic along the edge. And um, in addition to this goal function, of course, we have constraints. And in our case, we have two different constraints that we need to, to really satisfy and a correct solution to the problem. Those constraints are linear. The first constraint simply implies, requires that every passenger that leads, leaves its uh, origin with a car would get to its destination with the same car, which is quite natural, of course. In addition to that, we also need to ensure that the system is rebalanced. In what sense? We have uh, empty vehicles that would otherwise accumulate in the destinations of passengers. And so we need to ensure that we can send those empty vehicles uh, back to pick up the next passenger. Now, this second component is much more tricky to ensure compared to uh, the conservation of passenger flow, because we not only need to specify for every empty vehicle, for instance, for this one, what is the route that it takes, but also who, who is the passenger that it picks up from which vertex? Because this is something that our optimization approach needs to come up as it goes. And we cannot, uh, we cannot determine this a priori before we, we actually run the algorithm.
So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the main <clears throat> algorithmic insight that we obtain in our work is that we can transform the previous problem that I mentioned, AMOD routing, into a traffic assignment problem. The only difference between AMOD and TAP or traffic assignment is that the latter doesn't require uh, the rebalancing of the system. So essentially this problem, which has the exact same uh, goal function and conservation of passenger flow constraints represents a setting where we have multiple travelers that have their own individual vehicles. And the only question is how do we route them in the most effective manner in order to minimize the total travel time of all the passenger, of all the driver. And we don't need to care about rebalancing constraints because each of those passengers has its own vehicle. Okay, so how do we achieve this transformation? <clears throat> so let us start with the initial uh, input to our problem. We have the graph and we have the characterization of the travel demand. The, the main idea here is so in addition to uh, one component that is already present from the AMOD problem in the traffic assignment problem is that we need to specify routes for uh, those passengers from the origins of the, and the destination. And this already follows from the definition of the problem. The second issue is how do we, by working within the framework of traffic assignment, we can still ensure the rebalancing of the system. So for that, we do the following. First, we observe that by looking just at the travel demand pattern, we know exactly where empty vehicles would accumulate. And this would be in those three vertices. So in order to represent those rebalancing constraints in the formulation of the traffic assignment problem, we can think about the empty vehicles as if they were new travelers, new kind of demand which begins in those vertices. Now, the next step is in a traffic assignment problem, every traveler has its own origins and destinations which are known a priori. Whereas in AMOD routing, this is not the case, but we can resolve it quite easily because we can introduce a new vertex uh, to the graph, which connects all the, uh, all the origins of the passengers and with an edge. And this vertex represents the target location of all the rebalancing vehicles, of all of those vehicles we have here on the left. Now, how do we ensure that we still rebalance the system? The main idea here is that we can specify specific volume uh, travel time functions over those red edges such that if we solve this new traffic assignment problem, then we essentially induce a solution for the AMOD routing problem in which the system is rebalanced. So how do we in interpret a solution of the traffic assignment problem in, in this new setting? We simply look where every empty rebalancer is going end up, to end up, of course, it will reach this rebalancing destination node, but the previous vertex along the way would be the passenger demand that it actually rebalances. And in fact, not only that we guarantee that we rebalance the system, but also by solving optimally traffic assignment problem, we will get an optimal solution for the AMOD routing problem. And this is something that we prove mathematically in our paper. Now, and for the final step, I already mentioned a few of the details. We apply for the traffic assignment problem that we just designed a, a Frank Wolf algorithm, which is a gradient descent algorithm for convex optimization. The main thing to, to note here is that the, 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 main, the, the most uh, heavy component that we need to compute in every step is we need to find a new assignment, Y, in step K, that minimizes this expression. 
This is the gradient of the goal function of the traffic assignment problem. Which, so if we break down this expression, what we will see it is that it is equal to this goal function. Now, it, this goal function is very similar to the original goal function that we had earlier, but it has one crucial di difference, which is that we multiply the assignment of the number of vehicles that we have along every edge. Now, with this expression, Earlier in the setting of traffic assignment problem, this expression was in itself a function of the travel demand. Whereas in the new case, this travel demand, this XK is already fixed from the previous expression. So essentially uh, solving uh, each linearization step corresponds to uh, finding several individual shortest paths, which do not really affect, do not affect at all the travel time from one vehicle to another, and which we can do very efficiently. <clears throat> and nowadays we're looking into several extensions of this um, approach to both uh, provide more efficient solutions in practice and to capture uh, several, uh, more um, technologies and properties of the real world. For example, one of the things that we really would like to understand is how to combine this uh, approach with ride-sharing capabilities where we have multiple passengers that not necessarily travel between the same origin destination to share the same vehicle. Another important aspect that we're not really capturing that well in the approach that I just mentioned to you is uh, behavior of users. Currently, we're assuming that the travel demand of users is actually fixed. And we know from economics that this is not an, uh, an unnatural assumption to make. We know actually that the, um, the de demand for a certain service actually depends on the quality of the service that we provide. And it would be important to understand how uh, the solution that we, uh, the quality of the solution in terms of travel time, for instance, influences how many passengers we have in our network. And this, this of course leads to a better understanding of how those systems would be deployed in the future and how much congestion would we actually in, incur using a, a MOD fleets. And by tackling this uh, challenging aspect, we hope to also understand the entire ecosystem, which consists of both uh, selfish passengers that only want to minimize their travel time an operator of an AMOD fleet, AMOD system, and the municipality that operates public transit services. <clears throat> In, from a more broader perspective, it would be crucial to capture and to understand how we can incorporate into our optimization objectives, not only um, goals that uh, represent minimizing the solution cost or the total travel time, but also capture societal goals such as fairness and accessibility. And here in an ongoing work with uh, Devash Jelota, we're trying to strike a balance between the quality of the solution that we provide and the level of fairness that we guarantee throughout the system. The thing is that if we only strive to minimize the operational cost of the system, we can get solutions that are very unfair. For example, we can get for two passengers that have the precise same origin and destination, different, vastly different travel times throughout the system. So our question here is, how can we balance between this level of, some level of fairness and a high quality of solution? Even more broadly, it would be essential to understand how we can balance between the amount of benefit that users of those systems get from using them and the disutility that we incur to the environment or the society. For example, there is a, an obvious trade-off between uh, running, uh, minimizing travel time, which would uh, route vehicles through uh, uh, quiet neighborhoods and maximizing the utility of residents in those streets. 
and it will be very important to understand how this can be captured. The last thing that I would like to mention is that although the, it would take a few more years before we actually see AMOD systems operating in the real world, and the, some of the approaches that we're already developing and the insights that we gain along the way can already be used today to understand uh, how to effectively operate a ride hailing services. Mm -hmm. If, for example, in a recent project uh, together with uh, Stanford uh, Center for Automotive Research, we are developing a tool for policymakers and operators of ride hailing services to understand what is the ride composition of uh, ride hailing fleet in terms of the proportion between um, vehicle, uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles and uh, standard vehicles to guarantee uh, access to wheelchair users, which is currently not addressed well enough with, within our current uh, ride hailing uh, services. And for that, we're developing a queuing theoretic approach to, uh, to, to really obtain what, to understand what is the right proportion for every given scenario in terms of those uh, different vehicles. So with that, I would like to wrap up uh, my talk, we start with very basic uh, problems or basic, very basic capabilities that we need to uh, be able to uh, tackle in order to deploy multi-robot systems in the real world, namely multi-robot motion planning and task allocation. And from that, we gradually uh, move to a larger and larger scaled systems where it's important not only in, to understand how we can run those systems effectively in terms of uh, if their performance, but also to capture the interactions of those systems with the environment and the society as a whole. So with that, I would like to thank all the collaborators that I mentioned uh, for this talk, and in particular, uh, my uh, mentors, advisors, and collaborators, uh, Dan Halperin, uh, Kostas Beckris, and uh, Marco Pavone. And I would like to also thank you for uh, your attention. I would now take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kirill. Um, does anyone have any questions? Because I have quite a few. Do we need to raise our hands or something, or do we just speak? You can just uh, go ahead. Uh, Professor Kirtha, thank you so much for your for your time and presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was quite insightful. But, but mm -hmm. I had a, a very interesting question about uh, the drone delivery. Uh, yeah. So you said that the drone is supposed to mount onto, let's say, uh, a bus or a public transportation. But just from an abstract perspective, but doesn't that defeat the purpose of the drone? Like the purpose of the drone delivery is to travel through air through a wide range of spaces without the need of going on, on the ground. Like what would be the yeah. difference between a drone going onto a bus and an Uber delivering it? So this is something that uh, I have to think about. So I would, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's really my question. Yeah, thank you for the question. So maybe I, I didn't emphasize it well enough, but it, it's not that the drones only use public transit. They can hop between different vehicles and um, and they can fly. It's just that sometimes it's more preferable. So there is there is a trade-off between just flying and sitting on a bus for the, the whole time. And we want to understand how to use, to combine both flight modes and uh, the, the situation when drones sit on those buses to deliver the packages in the most efficient manner. So the thing is that, mm -hmm. the, Allowing drones to sit on those buses allows allows us to extend the, the range of those drones because they just can conserve their their energy. This is the main uh, the mm -hmm. main aspect here. I mm -hmm. see. I see. Um, uh, Professor, also one more question that I had in mind. Um, so we've talked about the sampling based methods for the uh, for the for the motion planning. Um, can these motion, these sampling based methods? I remember also I read once about the, the tree method, the branching tree method rather than just putting samples all over the place. Um, can these methods be applied to a wide, very wide variety of, of robotics? For example, you talked about the satellite, but also there is here like, for example, six degree of freedom arms. There is also, for example, the warehouse robotics. This method works for all of them. And what, what are the drawbacks 
between the sampling method and potential fields, for example. So why did you explain this rather than the potential fields? Even though potential field, uh, to my very little knowledge, uh, I just started my graduate degree, potential fields are used more in real time. So what are the differences and uh, why do you recommend this one rather than that one, the potential fields? And yeah, that, that's really my question. And so, so you had essentially two questions. The first one was yeah, whether, exactly. whether you can apply those algorithms. And you also mentioned tree-based sampling based planners and whether we can apply them to a variety of systems. So the, the, the answer for that is yes, but we need to be careful in the sense that we need, we have, uh, we, we know that we, we have some proofs that show that for certain uh, systems, which are quite uh, simple in the sense that we only require them to be uh, leaf sheets continuous, if we if the system has this property that we we can guarantee that the solution is found, and we actually also have nowadays a proofs that show that we can converge to the optimal solution in such cases. Okay. So this is the first part. And the second is um, you, you asked about the difference between those approaches uh, and potential fields. And you also didn't mention, but there is another approach which is trajectory optimization. So the mm -hmm. benefit of sampling based planners compared to those approaches is that we have global guarantees on the solution quality and on completeness. We are guaranteed mm -hmm. to find a solution no matter what. I mean, in, is, is, considering that we're using those algorithms correctly. And this property is very important when we're moving to the setting of multi-robot motion planning because we not only need to, to capture one small sweep of, of the space of the robot, but we need to have a coverage of the full space because we don't know a priori where we need to send the different robots to coordinate to achieve a collision-free uh, solution. Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much, Professor Kerr. I really appreciate it. All right, uh, Philippe Nado has a question. He's asking, would it be possible for a user to know approximately their travel time before entering the car? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So this is, um, I, I do think that we, we are getting close to that. Um, hopefully with some in a more, uh, in a more advanced version of those algorithms, we would be able to to tell that. The thing is, why am I hesitant to say this right now that we, we still don't have this property? Our approach is making some assumptions about the, the um, uh, structure of uh, traffic flow or properties of traffic flow. And it's currently not applicable to a case where the flow, uh, where we have demand that is changing throughout the day rather than uh, the setting where the travel demand is fixed which only applies to certain, certain parts of the day. So to really understand, to really capture travel times, we would need to capture, to uh, model more accurately um, a traffic flow in our, in our paper and this, in our approach. And this is really something we are working on. But definitely this is some guaranteeing or telling every user what is the travel time would definitely be possible in the next few years. Uh, Nicholas Sinclair is asking, what opportunities do you think there are for implementing decentralized swarm systems to solve multi-robot optimization problems? Um, I, I, I have to admit that I don't fully understand the question. Yep. Is he asking about uh, um, swarm optimization methods? Or maybe, maybe uh, Nicholas, do you want to comment on that? Sure, yes. Uh, and I just want to say I am in first year right now. So uh, an opportunity like this, I just want to say it's fantastic. I'm still very new uh, to this. Uh, but I, I have heard that there are ways of, um, of coordinating multi robot systems using a more decentralized approach. I'm just wondering, just generally, do you sort of um, do you what, what opportunities do you think there are uh, for solving, say, like congestion problems uh, and organizing those uh, multi robot systems along those lines? So I'm, I'm not too much knowledgeable in the area of swarm, uh, swarm control. What I do know about swarms is usually they use very simple uh, uh, kinds of behaviors for the robots to, to accomplish certain uh, tasks. And usually those tasks are quite simple. And I do think that in our, ca in our case, it, we can actually um, 
we, we have the benefit that the system is centralized because that way we can get the most effective performance out of it. This is something that we're really interested to get in. And from a decentralized perspective, it would be probably much harder to get. So there is a trade-off between the simplicity of, of the approaches that you use, which are used in swarm optimization, and between uh, the, the, the quality of the solution that we get in a, in a centralized approach. And, and, and remember here that when we're talking about optimizing in traffic, every percent of, uh, of, of improvement that we can make can save a lot of money and time for, for companies or the society. And this is very important to, to get, to really nail down what is the best performance that we can get. Great, so in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can, uh, have, we can get any uh, further questions that people have and we can forward them to uh, Kirill over email if people are interested. But maybe we can move on to the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, and that's in another Zoom link, though, which you probably received. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining us. Uh, and thanks to Kirill uh, for, uh, for a great talk. Thank you all, it was a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to forward them to me in the email. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Carol.